Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to be back here. I first spoke here in 2011 in the inaugural Wired conference at St. Pancras. And in those days, I was talking about my aspirations to deliver breakthroughs in performance. Uh, today, I can show you just how far we've come in those uh, brief four years. And I'll take you on a journey from Formula One to elite and professional sports, and then out into health and wellness. But first, let's say a little bit about applied technologies. Most of you think of McLaren as a Formula One team, and it's true, we're proud of that heritage. We've had an unrivaled track record over 52 years in that sport. But actually, the next big thing at McLaren is McLaren Applied Technologies. We're now the fastest growing, most profitable part of the group, and we're on an ambition to develop a global technology firm. When we set ourselves up just over five years ago, we set ourselves the mission to deliver breakthroughs in performance through the application of advanced technology and design. We weren't so limited as to limit ourselves to race technology and applying it into other fields like medicine. If instead, we said it was a combination of technology that's emerging and a mindset that's prevalent within Formula One uh, to adopt continuous innovation and rapid prototyping of solutions so we could test these out in practice. That mission shaped the sort of people that we like to work with. These are pioneers and visionaries who share our singular ambition to win. I mean, racing has an existential need to win, as Bruce McLaren used to say, to win is to be. For us, in business terms, winning is being the best of whatever we do, going beyond the limits of performance, or being the first to do something. And I'll hopefully show you that we've held that high bar in everything that we do here. Um, and the sort of people we work with, they tend to co-create with us. So these are not McLaren products that go to market. They're usually big brand name products that get out there. So talking of products, let's start with racing on this journey. A racing car is really never a finished product. It's a prototype. To be competitive, we have to accelerate the pace of evolution of this prototype throughout the season from one year to the next. Um, we have to instrument it so that we fully understand how that prototype behaves. And in fact, McLaren supplies that remote condition monitoring technology to all of Formula One, all of NASCAR, and all of IndyCar. So we are market leaders in that respect. We always want to use objective measured data to shape our thinking. So we measure what we want to manage, we build up models, and then we use that model to actually manage the genesis and evolution of the product or the operation that goes on in racing. You could think of Formula One as the ultimate team sport. I think of it as an engineer, as more a race of engineering than it is of driver skill. Now then, let's see how we design that prototype. And this is quite novel. This is our high performance sensors where we design race cars and currently supercars. What you see is a Formula One chassis in which we sit the driver, and then what's behind them is where the engineers and designers set up the car. Now, actually, the driver is racing a mathematical model. He's in a virtual environment that creates stimuli in his brain, or the cues, as we say, that make him think he's driving the real thing. And what's novel about this is, let's say it in lay language, it's like putting the customer in the product and bringing a design team into the environment of the customer. We've measured so much on this product in the real world that we now have the ability to change parameters in that product and get instant feedback from the customer. This is a product design dream. And actually, we are the first in Formula One to take this approach, to use simulation to design the product and get the optimum performance out of the entire system. So what are the design principles here? Human first, model the entire system for maximum impact, and then bring the designer into the environment of the consumer. That's a design principle that we'll uh, keep close to our hearts. Now then, when that product actually goes out in, in the real world, we leave nothing to chance. So as Zhao said, we measure actually thousands of parameters on the product, and we stream hundreds of parameters back to mission control, which is what you see behind me. This is where we run real-time strategy and decision-making based on the health and condition of our complex system, which is a car, um, during the race. So the back row is strategists, the second row are engineers, and the front row are the infrastructure people that make sure that we get that vital data brought back to us. But we don't measure for measurement's sake. We, we measure for actionable intelligence. 
because a measurement implies a sensor, which implies weight, which impedes performance. So we ask ourselves the question, also a design question, what questions we're trying to answer before we start instrumenting up this car. And in fact, we try to get the maximum insight from the minimum amount of data, because the bandwidth is quite limited. So we don't talk big data, we talk big insight from small data. And that's a design philosophy that we think applies in many industries. Um, in here, we don't just monitor the condition of the health of the car, rather, we actually run thousands of scenarios so that we can go from actionable intelligence to predictive intelligence. The live data is fed into models which have been built up from over a decade's worth of being digital. So now we say the further back we can look, the further forward we can see. So in split seconds, we can make very quick decisions about what interventions to make, and more importantly, what the likely outcome of that intervention will be in real time. And over time, and with machine learning, we've got to prescriptive intelligence. So literally where the code tells us what the winning move should be. And when we can do that in the medical space, well then I'll say we could change the game, but we're far from being there. If I was to sort of summarize maybe what elements from racing can be translated into other fields, I might start with saying, if we can measure the health of an engine, why can't we measure the health and condition of any machine or even the people that operate the machine? That's our philosophy. Any measurement that gives actionable intelligence. Then we'll feed that intel into a model and aim for the predictive intelligence. We'll use simulations so that we can start to support our decision-making capabilities or start to understand how the product or process is actually being operated. So, in some respects, you could say if we can capitalize on the convergence today of data management, predictive analytics, and simulation, we should be able to produce high-performance design of products and processes. And really, that's the business that we're in. So the journey started with Martin Johnson's uh, English rugby squad going back some, some way. The design challenge he had was he wanted to understand how overtraining translated to impairment of performance in a game. So he asked us to basically instrument his players and understand how hard they're working, how much work is being done to them, and see did that correlate to risk of injury in a game. Now Andy knows that's not an exact science, and so being engineers, we obviously think everything's deterministic, so we were confident we could do something. We set out, set up body area networks, satellite tracking of these assets that we call players, and we built all sorts of complex models about how these guys worked. Three years later, we come down to a very simple set of accelerometers that cost about three pound each. We got massive insight from very simple measurement using very complex analytical techniques and deep learning to extract the context of the measurements that we are producing. And we saw that this was really important. If we understood the context, we understood if you were in a scrum or a mall, really that told me so much more about the basic measurements of acceleration than all of this complex medical kit that we set out with. We also found, to our surprise, that you couldn't aggregate across the squad. So there's no such thing as anybody who's run 10 kilometers in training needs a rest. It depended on who you were. So we had to personalize the insight, which complicated it for us a little more. But over time, we, we got to algorithms, some of which are still being used today, that delivered answers in the right time for the coach, was predictive in nature, and allowed us to de-risk the performance of individual players. If we took that to ourselves in everyday life, and that's not me in the photo, by the way, um, I wish, but we, we, we would like to understand our condition in the morning and understand what interventions can you make in order to get peak performance later on in the day. And we try to do this with our, our, ourselves. Within McLaren, we consider ourselves an elite team, and so we try to push our own performance. And we've found the same sort of things as we did with rugby. It has to be personalized. There's no baseline level for everybody. And we use very, very simple measurement to get really substantial insight about our, our likely performance based on our individual personal profile. Now, when we tried to take this into the medical space, we had a big breakthrough. We formed a strategic alliance with the largest pharmaceutical company in the world, GlaxoSmithKline. And their design challenge was really to get much richer insight from clinical trials. And they chose us to work with them on a range of 
um, challenges were the disease caused or was manifest as impairment in mobility. And we may be checking drugs or medicines to see could they improve the mobility or delay the deterioration. So we actually worked in Parkinson's, stroke recovery, and ALS, ALS being a disease um, associated with the ice bucket challenge that most of the world now knows about. Um, what we did though, we thought in a clinical trial, these are very, very limited in terms of insight that you get. People go into a clinical setting maybe once every quarter and have a mobility assessment or fill in a questionnaire that gives qualitative feedback. What we thought was if for rugby players we could understand the context for a measurement that we were getting, why can't we do the same for ourselves in a clinical trial? And so we, we set out testing on ourselves initially, putting simple sensors, simple chips uh, uh, on our body, and we found um, it's not this position, this is just so we could take a photograph, but we actually found the optimum position on the body to understand the context of whether somebody's walking, sitting, sleeping, running, etc. And then we used deep learning techniques again to try and spot tiny anomalies which give us an early warning, almost a pre-symptomatic warning when somebody was trending towards a problem. It's not pure medical science, but it's great biomechanic insight that an intervention or a checkup may well be necessary. We, so we learned here that simple sensors could give us large insights. We found that to get people to adopt these things, they needed meaningful insight, both the clinician and the user. And we found that we got lots more insight because we could measure continuously over an extended period rather than once a quarter. The presentation of the data became crucial. So we use gamers on our side to design the presentation of the information so that we don't have the usual problem that people have technology but they don't adopt it. Here we got rapid adoption from the cohort of patients on all of these trials, which I should say was the first time that GSK performed real-time biotelemetry in their history last year. Here's it's just showing our analysts analysis of gait and posture and correlating the two. But all designers will tell you form factor is important. So we didn't put chips on people's necks. We designed using our industrial design team. In this case, it's a collar that could go underneath your shirt so it's not visible. That would also assess the information that we needed on gait and mobility in a more elegant fashion and allowed the patients, if you will, to use the sensing more often throughout the day. Um, so we had very minimal rejection uh, with this particular form factor. And this suggests to me that what might bring the breakthrough in adoption of some of this technology, which I believe is quite mature and accelerating, especially with the computational and analytics prowess, I think the fashionistas in the audience might see that if we could embed some of this intelligence into the clothes we were, or if we could um, produce form factors that are more appealing to people like earrings, like uh, shirt stiffeners, for example, or collar stiffeners that basically measure the same data, and get ourselves away from the need to have a geeky looking watch that measures um, non-medical data, then we'll get a breakthrough. And we are finding we're working with some um, leading household brands to work on chips the size of the one you see in that picture and innovative ways to present the insight as we go. So in wrapping, we talked about measuring humans. I also think we need to capitalize on the internet of things today and instrument the devices we use to deliver the drugs. We've done justice with inhaled drugs to see that how people are really using the product. If you think back to that Venn diagram, the embedded intelligence is there to inform me how people are using the product and inform the user how to get more from that product. If we take that to its limit, I should have adaptive intelligence and I can make that product adapt to who the user is or the environment that they're in. That's our design philosophy. And then when, as we did, we put such a product out into a large cohort of people, we get a map of consumption of why people, or when and why people are starting to take a particular medicine and whether they're doing that correctly. And finally, our latest and probably best frontier for um, breakthroughs in performance will be training and performance of surgeons. 
So we started on a program of surgical simulation using wearable technology to answer the design challenge, what makes a good surgeon? And how do I spot those very early on in a surgical training program who are likely to make the cut, no pun intended, but also not like likely to go on to become a proper surgeon, avoiding all that expense and frustration for a cohort that started really, truly intelligently. So I'm gonna close there and say, I, I think breakthroughs in medical space will come not just from design and technology, but it'll definitely need um, a change of mindset. So in the reception tonight, I'm gonna stick around. Don't ask me, can it be done? Ask me how, thank you. So when is McLaren going to enter the uh, wearable device market? Okay, we already are working yeah. with top brands. But where can I buy it? I would say by next year you should see some products. Yeah. Okay. And I noticed that all of your wearable devices are not on the wrist. Yes. They're on the upper body. Why, why is that? Well, if you want to understand uh, the context of some basic measurements, you need to understand your posture. So if it's on your wrist, that doesn't really help to tell you whether I'm sitting or running. Mm -hmm. You want to get the upper body orientation. So the sensors need to be somewhere on your upper body, is all I can say. Is all you can say. Yeah. Um, the surgical simulator, so that project started now. When do you expect to have some sort of results that we can write about? Uh, okay, so some of the algorithms that we developed actually for um, context modeling in rugby, which are now um, being filed for patents for. Um, we have similar approaches to surgery, mm -hmm. but I think probably you're talking 10 years from now before we have realistic surgical simulators. But we started a few years back, we've seen that some of the techniques that we used in sport and the clinical trials, they're yielding um, very okay. great insight. But with all these deep learning projects, it takes an awful lot of time, and we're still working with very small cohorts at the moment. But you see the wearable that the surgeons are starting to use. Yeah. So we're tracking students and experienced staff and seeing the beauty of the good surgeons and you see the erratic movements of the poor ones. Okay. It's like a musician. You can spot who's going to make it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank